Matthew chapter 28 verse 1 In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that you seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. The Lord bless his word in Jesus' name. I'm speaking on the subject from the cross to the grave to the rise. What exactly transpired through the cross to the grave and to the rise of the master? We are looking at what happened as an objective from the cross to the grave to the rise second objective we'll be looking at some revelations from the resurrection and third we shall look at the power of the resurrection and finally We shall walk in the reality of the resurrection. Understanding what happened from the cross to the grave to the rise. Understanding some revelations of the resurrection. Understanding the power of the resurrection. And then walking in the reality of the resurrection. Welcome first of all to Easter day of 2020 hallelujah I don't want you to feel very very bad that you are celebrating Easter Sunday morning at home don't the Bible said known unto God are all his works from the foundation of the world Acts 15 18 nothing as drastic as this can happen without God's allowance or God's allowing it wasn't that God hasn't heard the prayers many expected to do Sunday morning service in church but it was not to be and you are wondering what's going on it is not beyond the visibility the mentality and the understanding of God. One day he told his disciples when he wanted to wash their feet and they are wondering what are you doing. He said, what I do now you do not understand. But in the hereafter, you will understand. Many of us are unable to understand what is on now. But will understand. So just be, be fully aware that God is fully aware of this day and where you are now and where you are celebrating the Easter now so come down and hear his word from the grave from the cross to the grave to the rise what is it exactly that happened from that cross number one the Lord laid on Jesus the iniquity of the world. That's the first thing. The whole process is the fact that God laid 
on Jesus, the iniquity of the world. In John chapter 1, verse 29, when John saw Jesus coming, he said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Take it away the sin of the world. In Isaiah chapter 53, verse 4, 5, 6, we read that he said, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep, we have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. When the high priest was handing, was, was handing Jesus over for crucifixion, he was doing his work. <laughs> Because the high priest's duty in the Old Testament was to lay his hands on the ram, on the goat, on the lamb of atonement. He will lay his... Now there were two, there were two animals. There was one called the scapegoat and the other one, the sin offering. Both of them were together. They will lay, he will lay his hands on the scapegoat, confess the sins of the whole nation of Israel, and lead that goat into the wilderness, outside the city, bearing the sin and going. The second goat, the second animal for the offering was sacrificed. And then the blood of that animal was sprinkled on the altar in the Holy of Holies as an atonement for the sins of the, of the nation of Israel. He did that once in a year. Here was the high priest again laying his hands not on an animal sacrifice now without his own notice. He wasn't aware of what he was doing. When he said crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. He was not aware that he was performing his priestly duty. Offering the sacrifice. This one man was both the scapegoat and the sin offering. And they led him out like they led the scapegoat out. Out of the city. Into the wilderness upon Golgotha on Mount Calvary. Outside the city. Just fulfilling the perfect pattern of the Old Testament. And he offered him a sacrifice, handed him over for the executors. Fulfilling his high priestly duty. That was the first thing that happened. <laughs> what a wonderful God. He was offering the Passover lamb, the Passover ram. And sacrificing like he had always done. The only difference is that this will be his last assignment as high priest. The other times he offered the goat once a year. This one was one offering forever. For the whole of the world, not just for Israel now. Number two thing that happened is that the Lord looked away. The father looked away from the son. Once he had become united with the sins of the world. The father looked away. The father looked away and became separated from the son. Once he became united with the sins of the world. That was why Jesus cried. In Matthew chapter 27 verse 45 and 46. Now from the sixth hour there was darkness over all the, all, all the land unto the ninth hour and about the ninth hour jesus cried with a loud voice saying eli eli lama sabachthani that is to say my god my god why hast thou forsaken me why 
he was asking because he had been made sin and according to Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13 he said God is of a purer eyes thou art of a purer eyes than to behold evil thou cannot look upon iniquity Isaiah chapter 59 verse 1 to 2 he said behold the Lord's hand is not short in that it cannot save. Neither is ear heavy that it cannot hear. He said, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid his face from you. When Jesus was made sin, the father hid his face. He looked away. That was the first time in, in, from eternity, dateless past, that the son, and the father we have been separated because of the iniquity of man and you don't understand the consequence of jesus carrying the iniquity that is the sinless spotless lamb of god who never knew what was called sin be united with a nature that was not his if you had dipped little cat inside mud <laughs> that was nothing compared you know how clean the cat wants to be and you pushed him in mud or you sprinkled excrement on a person that is known for hygienic living you haven't done the worst or the ground cockroach and detestable insects and rubbed it all over your body and gave some to you for you to eat. It's not comparable for Jesus Christ being united with sin. A nature he detests with his soul, with his life. And the father looked away when he became sin. So the first thing he became, he was made sin. The second thing, the father looked away after he, was, he had become sin. And the third thing, the veil of the temple was torn. In two from the top top to the bottom he, Matthew chapter 27 verse 51 that is the veil of the temple what separated the holy place from the holy of holies and behold the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom and the earth did shake and the rocks rent the veil of the temple was torn do you understand the implication of the tearing of that veil there are two major implications, but let me explain one or two to you. Now, in the Old Testament, that big veil that we're talking about now, there were the three courts. There was the outer court, then the inner court, and then the holy of the holies. The inner court or the holy place was separated from the holy of the holies by a very, very thick blanket about 18 feet tall up to down that separated the holy of holies from the outer court from the inner court three courts now if you look at hebrews chapter 9 verse 1 to 9 you will look at how the bible describes it, it said then verily the first commandment had also ordinances of divine service and a worldly sanctuary he said for there was a tabernacle made the first wherein was the candlestick and the table and the shoe bread which is called the sanctuary and after that the second veil the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all that's the second veil that one had the golden censer and the ark of the covenant overlaid round about with gold wherein there was a golden pot that had manna and aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant and then over it the cherubims of glory overshadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly it is on that mercy seat that the blood of sacrifice was sprinkled now when these things were done so then the priest went always into the first tabernacle accomplishing the service of god he was there but into the second that is the the one the, the holiest of all when the priest the high priest alone once every year only once a year not without blood which he offered for himself and for the errors of the people the holy ghost this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not made manifest while as here the first tabernacle was here standing now this is it just to spare you the details 
that holy of holies that cutting the priest entered into it once a year and as it was said in the old testament there was a rope around his waist and bells on, on on the skirts of his garment in case he offers a wrong sacrifice and he dies in there nobody can enter there only the high priest enters there once a year and if he falls down there the bell will ring and the people will realize that the man has fallen and dropped dead they will pull him out by that rope that was his duty his assignment present sacrifice there once a year but just now after his last sacrifice was offered that curtain of separation was torn the meaning of that is first high priest your assignment is forever over you have offered the last sacrifice and the way into the holy of holies is permanently open this sacrifice now has cleared every single sacrifice and then next anybody can enter this holy place now it is not only left for you anymore what a wonderful savior what a, I, I i wish that the high priest who was who was there at that time would have understood what he was doing he would have realized that he was the most crucial high priest in the days of aaron who offered the ultimate ultimate sacrifice and ended the reign of the old testament and stepped us into the new testament the veil of the temple was torn after that number four the master gave up the ghost as a consequence of the seeds of the world the master gave up the ghost for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of god was that no romans 3 23 the wages of sin is death the wage okay for all have sinned and come short of the glory of god 6 23 for the wages of sin is death that death he died that death as a consequence of the wages of sin in luke chapter 22 verse 46 to verse 47 luke 22 46 and he said unto them why sleep he rise and pray lest he enter into temptation and while all right okay he gave up the ghost as a consequence of the sins of the world so you see the progression he was made sin the father got separated from him the veil of the temple was torn in twain from top to bottom maybe i'll read uh, matthew 27 from verse 47 matthew 27 from verse 47 some of them that stood by when they had heard that said this man called for elias and straight away one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with vinegar and put it on a reed and gave him to drink and the, and the rest said let's let be let's see whether elias will come to save him jesus when he had cried again with a loud voice yielded up the ghost he gave up the ghost and now after that after giving up the ghost we, we go to step i believe that will be number five or number four the master went to pay what you are to meet or to fulfill the claims of justice and pay the penalty for sin he has died he has given up the ghost he now went further to pay the claims of justice to fulfill the claims of justice and pay the penalty for the sins of mankind that was when he went into the belly of, of the earth into the lower parts of the earth into hell psalm 16 verse 8 to 11 psalm 16 verse 8 to 11 the bible said i have said the lord always before me because he's at my right hand i shall not be moved therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoiced my flesh also shall rest in hope for thou will not leave my soul in hell neither will you suffer your holy one to see corruption it's repeated in acts chapter 2 verse 22 all the way to verse 28 and then in colossians chapter 2 and in verse 14 we read where he said he blotted out the handwriting of ordinances that was contrary to us which was contrary which was against us which was contrary to us he took it out of the way and he nailed it to his cross anything man was meant to suffer whatever man was meant to pay because of his sin he went there to pay it what a wonderful savior he went there to fulfill the claims of justice and he went there to pay the penalty of sins having done that the next thing he did 
was to establish the defeat of the enemy and obtain victory for mankind. The master went further to establish the defeat of the enemy and obtain victory for mankind. In Colossians chapter 2 and in verse 13 to 15, we just read that now. And, and you being dead in your sins and on circumcision of your flesh, has he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all your trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was contrary to us, that was against us and was contrary to us, he took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. In Revelation chapter 1 verse 11, he said that he was, the, he was he, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia and Ephesus and unto Osmina and Pergamos and Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. Next verse. Okay, verse 10. All right. Read verse 11 again. Alpha and the Omega. Right. I'm looking for that verse where he said, I, I am he that was dead and I am alive forevermore. I have the keys of hell and death. They will show that to us shortly. But in Psalm 24 verse 7, all the way to verse 10, Psalm 24 verse 7, psalm 24 verse 7 lift up your heads o ye gates and be lifted ye everlasting doors and the king of glory shall come in who is this king of glory the lord strong and mighty in battle the lord mighty in battle lift up your heads o ye gates even lift them up ye everlasting doors and the king of glory shall come in that was when jesus went into the domains of darkness to destroy now revelation 1 18 i am he that liveth and was dead and behold i am alive forevermore amen and i have the keys of hell and death hallelujah what a mighty 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 savior and this was in the fulfillment of the prophecy that god the father gave when he was rebuking satan who came in the form of of the serpent to deceive Eve and Adam and collect the dominion of man that was given at creation. He said in Genesis chapter 3 and in verse 15, he said the seed of the woman, this woman you just deceived now, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed. It shall bruise thy head and thou shalt bruise his heel. He's going to cause you head injury. Cross your head. That was what the master, the master went to do after he had been made sin. After the, after the father had looked away. After the veil of the temple was torn. After he had fulfilled and paid the claims of justice. Next thing he did was to establish the defeat of the enemy and obtain victory for mankind. After that, number seven, the master went to reclaim. Reclaim lost glory and dominion he went to reclaim lost glory and dominion I put it this way he went to reclaim the glory and dominion handed over to the enemy by Adam by the first man to reclaim the dominion you see when God made man God gave him dominion and, and he said be fruitful multiply replenish the earth have dominion but man a man submitted to Satan and lost that dominion and lost that glory you know, all have sinned and fallen short of glory. He came short of glory. All sinned and, and came short of glory. We read that already in Romans chapter 3 and in verse 23. And fell short of glory. But he said in Colossians chapter 1 verse 27 that Christ in you is the restoration of that glory. Is the reclamation of that glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He went to reclaim the dominion. Reclaim the glory. Reclaim the glory and the dominion that Adam lost. Eve lost and handed to Satan. He came to reclaim it. That was the seventh step 
and finally the master rose in victory the conclusion was his rise the master rose in victory ay, 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 ay. on the behalf of mankind victory for mankind in matthew chapter 8, 28 verse 18 all the way to verse 20 matthew chapter 28 verse 18, and jesus came and spake unto them saying all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth all power not some power not a portion of power all power is given go ye therefore and teach all nations baptizing them in the name of the father and of the son and, and of the holy ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever i have commanded you and lo i am with you always even unto the end of the world amen hallelujah beloved the victory of christianity is the resurrection of the master beloved if he was crucified and he was buried and he did not rise there will be no need for church paul the apostle said if christ is not risen our faith is in vain our profession is in vain our church going is banzastic is nothing if christ is not risen we are wasting our time there wouldn't be an Easter morning service. There wouldn't be even a preaching. But you hear the old song. It's a life. Amen. It's a life. Jesus is alive. Forever is alive. Amen. He's alive. Amen. He's alive. Jesus is alive. Forever is alive. Amen. He's alive. Amen. He's alive. Jesus is alive. What is the victory of the cross and the victory of resurrection? What victory does re the resurrection bring? Number one is the victory of life over death. That life won death. Death came to bury life. He couldn't hold life. Number two is the victory of love over hate. With wicked hands, they crucified him. With hatred and bitterness, they crucified love. But love cannot be finished by hate. It's the victory of life over death. The victory of love over hate. The victory of good over evil. It is not possible, it is never possible, it can never be possible that evil can overcome good. Is the victory of life over death, the victory of love over hate, the victory of good over evil, the victory of light over darkness. Is the victory of light over darkness. The Bible said, the light shineth in darkness and the darkness comprehended it. Not the forces of darkness, they came to bury light. But it was not possible. It's a victory of light over darkness. Number four or five is the victory of the truth over lie. The victory of truth over lie. The victory of truth, the truth of God's word over the lies of the devil. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Lie came. The Bible says that the devil is the father of all lies. Lie came to fight truth and it realized that truth can never be at the mercy of lie is the victory of truth over lie number six is the victory of righteousness over unrighteousness the victory of righteousness over unrighteousness the victory of godliness over lawlessness 
let it be clear beloved brothers and sisters that righteousness is superior to unrighteousness every any day godliness is superior to lawlessness any day is the victory of righteousness over unrighteousness number seven it is the victory of divine purpose over demonic program or the victory of divine purpose over enemy agenda it has been purposed from the foundation of the world the bible said is the lamb of god slain from the foundation of the world purpose that humanity be rescued and redeemed from the agenda of darkness and that purpose came to pass the victory of divine purpose over enemy program over demonic agenda what victory are we looking at number seven it is the victory of the wisdom of god <laughs> over the wiles of the devil the devil thought he was wise <laughs> crucify him nail him nail him let's finish him let's finish him the bible said had the princes of this world known they wouldn't have crucified the lord of glory the lord said go ahead and let me see how far you can go in your wisdom and he took them by surprise he took them by surprise he took them is the victory of the wisdom of god for jesus himself is the wisdom of god over the wiles of the enemy over the cunningness of satan that is what we celebrate at resurrection the victory of the wisdom of god over the wiles of the enemy number nine it is the victory of the goodness of god over the wickedness of the enemy the goodness of god will defeat overwhelm overpower any day the wickedness of the enemy it is the victory of the goodness of god over the wickedness of the enemy the victory of the goodness of god over the wickedness of the enemy the summary of it is number 10 the victory of the almighty over the enemy the victory of the almighty is the celebration of the superiority of the almighty over the enemy the victory of the almighty over the enemy that is what we celebrate at resurrection that light is life is more powerful than death that love is stronger than hate that good is superior to evil that light is more powerful than darkness that truth is heavier than lie that righteousness will defeat unrighteousness that the purpose of god will beat hands down the agenda of the enemy any day anytime that the wisdom of god will handle the cunningness of satan that the goodness of god in your life will overcome the wickedness of the devil in your life and in our nation and in our generation and in our community that the almighty is superior to the enemy that is what we celebrate at the resurrection before i begin to draw the curtains what revelations <laughs> get ready does the re resurrection present to us what can we what revelations you see life is meant to continuously give us light what do we see when we see resurrection beyond what we have said number one that god does not and cannot fight a lost battle god does not and cannot fight a battle he will lose he does not fight cannot fight does not fight a lost battle god does not and cannot fight a lost battle he does not know how to fight and lose once the enemy declares a fight against the almighty he, he already decided his defeat before the start of the fight i heard that in the military uh, realm when a person is come is planning to commit an offense he also plans to fulfill the punishment of the offense side by side with the offense he just prepares for the punishment when the enemy goes against the almighty he also go he also goes prepared for the consequences because god does not and cannot fight a lost battle 
that resurrection, the crucifixion, the 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 the, 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 the crucifixion, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus was the mo- I mean was the most heated confrontation between light and darkness since the creation of the earth until eternity. Maybe except the battle of Armageddon. And the devil lost. And the Almighty One, God, does not and cannot fight a lost battle. We see that from the resurrection. Number two, that God will all, always make the final move. God will always make the final move. The devil may make the first move, but the Almighty will make the final and conclusive move. The devil, you see, when they began crucify him, they were betraying him, they were selling him, they were doing all that and nail him, nail him. It was as if God was watching. Go on ahead and do what you can. Bury him, go ahead. And they put him in the grave, go ahead. And he went to the last part of the earth and God said, are you true? Give me space. He will always make the final move. The devil may make the first move in everything, but God always makes the final and conclusive move. The devil may have the first say, but God will have the final say. God, the devil does not own the final move and doesn't own the final say. Let that be real to you today. Thirdly, God always uses the enemy to achieve his purpose at the enemy's cost. He always uses the enemy to achieve his own purpose at the enemy's cost, at his expense. Do you understand that? Many times the devil thinks he was the one working only to realize at the end that he had been an instrument of God's work. God wanted his son sacrificed and he couldn't kill this, his son by himself. He needed somebody to fulfill the work. <laughs> he needed the, the, the sacrifice. The lamb of God must be sacrificed. And he wouldn't do it by himself. And he recruited the devil without the devil's notice. <laughs> you see, many times the devil may start with his evil motive and action. He will start and then suddenly realizes that everything has turned around for God's own purpose. That God was the beneficiary and the devil was the eternal loser. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6 to 8. And he said, How be to speak the wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor the princes of this world that are come to naught. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. Even the hidden wisdom. Which God ordained before the world to our glory. Which none of the princes of this world knew. For had they known it. They would not have crucified. The Lord of glory. Had they known. That is had I known. That was what was happening in the camp of the enemy. Have, oh had we known. What did we do to ourselves like this. We thought we are fighting God. Now we have fought ourselves. We thought we we're, were trying to spoil something. Now we have spoiled ourselves. That's right. That was the, why the Bible said in Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good to them that love God and to them that are called according to his purpose. Genesis chapter 50, verse 20 to 21. We saw the principle in the life of Joseph when he was telling his brethren, but as for you, you thought evil against me. What you planned was bad, but God meant it unto good. To bring to pass as it is this day. To save much people alive. You, you, you planned, what you planned was disaster. But see how God turned it around. Beloved, I don't know what is going wrong in your life right now. The enemy may have organized and orchestrated evil for you. But in this season of resurrection, God is turning it around in your favor and the devil shall be the loser. I like you to mark it. Some people are wondering what we are, what is happening on earth now. Did the devil cause it, or did the, or did God cause it? One thing I know: 
is that God is not an author of evil. God does not tempt with evil. I know, I know that for sure. So it is possible that uh, with all the theories we have of this and that, some biological whatever, all the theories we have, it may have, it may have commenced by an evil machination. But Jehovah is a specialist of stepping into situations that have evil motivations and intentions and destinations and turn it around for his purpose. So at the end of this whole thing, the devil will be the loser. Watch it. There are souls getting saved now who had never thought of church. A woman called me from the UK the other day and how the son who had been out of touch with God and doesn't want anything about God is now asking about God. He wants to know God. He wants to be saved. He wants to be baptized. He wants to know about the end time events. Ev everywhere. The devil will be the mega loser. God uses the enemy to achieve his purpose at the enemy's cost. And number four, listen to this. I said that in the seed of destiny also today in another way. One day of divine action can wipe out millenniums of enemy operation. One day. One day of divine action, divine manifestation can wipe out millenniums of enemy operation. One day, God moved in one day and what the devil had done for 1,000 years just wiped out at once. That was what the resurrection of Jesus, the crucifixion and resurrection did to Satan. What Satan did since the days of Adam over 4,000 years before that time was wiped out at once like we say in africa one blow seven die one day that is one act of god can wipe out centuries of satanic activity can wipe out millenniums of satanic activity and in your life in our nation in our world today it doesn't matter for how long the enemy has been at work i am here to prophesy there is a move of god in this season that is about to wipe the devil out and wipe out his agenda and activity in your life in your family in our land and in our generation because a day with the lord is like a thousand second peter chapter 3 verse 8 what people use one thousand days to do god can use a minute to do a thousand years is like a day hallelujah don't forget that that is what the resurrection teaches us one day of divine action can wipe out millenniums of enemy operation number five god is the god of surprising and surpassing recoveries surprising and surpassing recoveries he's the god of surprising and surpassing recoveries what's the meaning of that God does not, do, does not just cause you to recover what was lost. He makes you recover beyond the loss. Your recovery became far more than your loss. You locate far more than what was lost. It's like when the thief is found. Proverbs chapter 6 verse 30 to 31. He says, men do not despise a thief. If he's still to satisfy his hunger. Do you know what that means? Even if it was hunger that made him to steal. They won't pardon him because of that. They don't despise the thief because he's still to, 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 to satisfy his hunger. See, but if, if he be found. He will be made to restore sevenfold. 30 to 31. Sevenfold. He will give the substance of his house. He will be made to pay even more than what he stole. Everything he has will be considered as stolen property. That's what God does. He gives you back. He restores. He gives you back. Jesus Christ lost one life and gained so many lives. My life, your life, the life of the world. He lost a miraculous life and gained a mysterious life. I can't go into that now. Jesus, God, is the God of surprising and surpassing recoveries. 
whatever has been lost in this season to you whatever is missing around your life in this season i prophesy surpassing and surprising recoveries in the name of jesus and finally god allocates the enemy long term defeat for his short term victories <laughs> that is what the devil celebrates for a short term God makes him to pay for it for a very long time long term defeat for his that is the devil's small letter h for his for for satan's short-term victories the meaning of that to you is every victory you see the devil have in your life is for a short term the devil celebrated the victory over jesus at the cross for only three days and his defeat is being celebrated till tomorrow till eternity he was jubilating that he won for only three days when the resurrection happened he realized he's the greatest loser in the history of the earth you have not heard job chapter 20 verse 4 5 since man has been placed on the face of the earth knowest not thou these of old since man was placed upon earth that the triumphing of the wicked devil is shot and the joy of the hypocrite is for a moment the triumphing of the wicked devil is shot and the joy of the hypocrite is for a moment beloved i prophesy to you today every area of your life where the devil seemed to be winning i prophesy the summarization of that victory I prophesy the annulment of that victory and the commencement of his defeat and your victory in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah! Is somebody excited today? I am sure that you have heard a message of, of, of Easter today like never before. Let me begin to round off. What is the power of the resurrection? Number one, it is the power of absolute dominion and authority or in case that is tautological it is absolute dominion and authority over all the forces of the enemy the resurrection brought absolute dominion and authority over all the forces of the enemy what force is the force of sin sickness, death, evil, all. Acts chapter 2 verse 22 It was not possible for Jesus to be holding a man approved among you by miracles, wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as you yourselves also know. Jesus, Jesus of Nazareth. 23 him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God you have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God has raised up having loosed the pains of death because it was not possible that he should be holding of it. It is the power of absolute authority over the, all the forces of the enemy. Number two it is the power of transformation of life the power of transformation of life do you remember that all the people who walked and lived with Jesus before the resurrection after the resurrection most of them couldn't recognize him in Luke 24 verse 13 to 31 two disciples were going on the road to Emmaus he was talking with them the Bible said their eyes were holding they couldn't know him at the breaking of bread, their eyes open. Do you remember this? Mary, John chapter 20, verse 13. Mary, that was that, that, 
and they said mary magdalene and they said unto her woman why weepest thou she said unto them because they have taken away my lord and i know not where they have laid him and when she had thus said she turned herself back and saw jesus standing and knew not the same mary that it was jesus go on jesus said unto her woman why weepest thou whom seekest thou she still doesn't know she assuming that he him to be the gardener said to him sir if you have carried him from here tell me where have you laid him i will take i will uh, and i will take him away mary is talking to the same one that delivered her that she has spent her life serving and she was not aware i'm still reading jesus turned unto her said unto her mary he must have called her in the voice that she knew she turned herself and said unto him rabona which is to say master jesus said don't touch me for i have not ascended to my father maybe she wanted to rush but go to my brethren and say you see is the power of a transformed life no wonder in romans chapter 6 verse 4 talking about therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the father even so we also should walk in the newness of life his resurrection is to change our lives make you different from who people ever thought you were is the power of a transformed life thirdly it is the power of limitless life life that cannot be limited limitless life the power of the, a life that can't be limited you know jesus in john chapter 20 after the resurrection the doors were shut the bible said in john chapter 20 verse 19 and in verse 26 then the same day at the evening being the first day of the week when the doors were shut where the disciples were assembled for fear of the jews came jesus and stood in their midst the door was locked where did he pass he passed through the wall in john chapter in verse 26 the same thing after eight days again his disciples were within and thomas with them then came jesus the doors being shut and stood in the midst of them before now he always needed the door to enter anywhere he needed to but not after the resurrection it is the power of a limitless life before now when he made peter to catch fish the net break in luke chapter 5 verse 5 4 and 5 and 6 but after the resurrection he made peter to catch fish again and the net couldn't break john chapter 21 from verse 5 all the way probably to verse 11 then jesus said children have you any meat they answered him no and he said unto them cast the net on the right side of the sheep and you shall find they cast therefore and now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes therefore that disciple whom jesus loved said unto peter it is the lord now when simon peter heard that it was the lord he got his fisher's coat unto him for he was naked and did cast himself into the sea and the other disciples came in a little ship for they were not far from land but as it were 200 cubits dragging the net with fishes as soon as they were come to land they saw fire of coals that's another thing altogether and fish laid there on and bread this was people that had no food before food mysteriously appearing now jesus said unto them bring up the fishes which you have now caught simon peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes a hundred and fifty three and for all there were so many yet was not the net broken before the resurrection the net could break but not after the resurrection by the power of a limitless life before the resurrection the life he lived was a miracle after the resurrection it became a mystery it is from the miracle realm to the mystery realm a a a a, a limitless life limitless existence that is what the resurrection presents to us 
Let me stop here because you have heard so many things in one day. How do you appropriate? So we have absolute dominion and authority over the acts of the enemy, the transformation of life and a limitless life. How do you appropriate? How do you walk in the reality of the resurrection? It is the mystery of identification. Realizing that everything Christ did for you, he did with you. <laughs> Are you following me? Everything Christ did for you, he did with you. That is why the Bible says we are crucified with Christ. We are buried with him. We are resurrected with him. We are seated on the right hand of the Father with him. So, follow him through the process. And I identified three things basically. A. Live the crucified life. Let the cross, put it this way, let the cross walk on you. Galatians chapter 2 verse 20, Paul the apostle said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I. Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live, I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Let the cross of Calvary walk on you. Live the crucified life. That was what Paul meant when he said, for to me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Philippians chapter 1 verse 21. Let the cross at the cross at the cross when I foresaw the light and the burdens of my heart he rolled away it was then I faith I received my sight and now I am happy all the way. Live the crucified life. Let Calvary walk on your flesh. Let the cross crush those desires that are not of God. Let the cross crush the appetite for sin. Let the cross crush the pride, the rebellion, the arrogance, the anger, the bitterness, the lust, the pornography, the masturbation, the greed, the vice of avarice, the love of money more than the love of God. Let the cross crush the wickedness of heart that makes you to act on others heartlessly. Let the cross crush deception. Let the cross crush earthly physical pleasures that makes you spend hours on earthly things, on physical things, on your body, and you can't spend no time with God. Hours to do a hair. Hours to watch a movie. Hours to watch a sport. Hours. But not 10 minutes with God. You want the fullness of the resurrection life? You don't just give your life to Christ. Let the cross crush the flesh. Let people encounter you and encounter Christ. Let the first thing that people will see of you not be your flesh. Not be your seduction. Or your physical looks and appearance. Let them feel God when they see you. Let the cross walk on you. 
Is there anything standing between me and you, Jehovah? Is there anything standing between me and the, and the life of Jesus? Crush it. Crush that appetite. Crush that desire. Crush that passion. Crush that, 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 that tendency in my life. That is not of God. Let the cross walk on you. Number two, live in the newness of life. Live in the resurrected life. Of course, when the cross has walked on you, you will live in the newness of life. According to Romans chapter 6 verse 4, we are buried in baptism. 6 verse 4. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in the newness of life. Walk in the newness of life. Let something be new about you. It is not possible to claim to know Jesus if something doesn't change. Walk in the newness of life. Live in the resurrected life. Part of walking in the newness of life is living for him who died for you. A major reason why he died for us is so we can live for him. He died so we can live for him. He died for us. It is just natural to live for him. Let men see you. See him as they see you. Live for him. Tell somebody about him. Let somebody come to him because of you. Live for him. We don't have any life to live to ourselves. We live for him who died for us. And finally, live in the reality of your place on the throne. That is what will give us the dominion dimension. Of resurrection. Live in the reality of your place on the throne. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 6. The Bible says. Start from verse 1. Ephesians 6 from verse 1. And you has he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. All the way to verse, six, verse 1 to verse 6 please. Children. Ephesians chapter 2. Two, verse 1 to verse 6 verse 1 to verse 6 Ephesians chapter 2 and you has he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world according to the prince of the power of the air the spirit that now walketh in the children of disobedience among whom also we, ha we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind and we are by nature the children of wrath even as others but God who is rich in mercy for his great love wherewith he loved us even when we were dead in sins has quickened us together with Christ by grace you are saved and has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. And what place is that? That is the place in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 19 to 21 that is far above principalities and powers and dominion and rule. Walk in that mentality so that the victory, the dominion aspect of the resurrection can be a reality. The dog on the floor cannot back on the man on the 21st story building. It cannot. The snake on the ground floor cannot bite the man on the 60 story building. It cannot. You are seated right there and it is far above principalities and powers. You are in the realm that is far beyond the reach of harm. Far beyond the reach of enemy agenda. Far beyond the reach of witchcraft oppression. Let it be your package. Let Calvary walk, walk on you. Live in the newness of life and live in your reality on the throne. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Would you lift up your hands everywhere and just appreciate him? Father, we worship you. Father, we honor you. Father, we adore you. Father, we adore you. 
father we adore you father we glorify you father we praise you and shall die